What's up, everybody? This is Enlightened Masculinity Podcast, and I have a very special treat for you. The next seven or eight episodes are recycled podcasts from three of my other shows. If you don't know me, I'm Yogi Chris PhD, and I was hosting four podcasts simultaneously for about two years. And this particular episode is from a show called Science of Spiritual Growth, as well as the next six or seven episodes will be from Science of Spiritual Growth, which was a podcast that I did over 100 episodes for, and it was almost entirely focused on using communication as a measure of spiritual development, how your communication skills improved. Uh, this next episode was the top performing episode on science of spiritual growth. It continues to get tons of views, but I am closing out SOSG podcast and just recycling the best episodes for enlightened masculinity. Enlightened masculinity is a red pill show and it has a lot of this esoteric information in it. So I'm very happy and pleased to be presenting you some of the top episodes from the other shows that you may not discover unless you were subscribed to those shows. This, so this next episode is called What a Beautiful Soul Is or What is a Beautiful Soul? And this is one of the most beneficial episodes, I think, for you uh, in terms of the knowledge and understanding of spirituality and the separation between the soul, the mind, and the senses. And so I hope you enjoy. And of course, if you like it, then subscribe, leave a review. Throughout the episode, if you hear me refer to Science of Spiritual Growth, it's because it's a recycled podcast episode. So it's from that show, but definitely this is Enlightened Masculinity Podcast. Welcome everyone, Science of Spiritual Growth Podcast. I'm Yogi Chris, PhD, founder of Ninth Limb Yoga. You're seeing this streaming on my yoga YouTube, but definitely still share it. If you're catching the recording, definitely subscribe and follow. And there's probably a link somewhere that you can like, you know, get more involved, like find me on Instagram, Yoga Bliss Chris, or at ninthlim.com. That's the number nine T H L I M B dot com. So this is a beautiful soul. And a beautiful soul is something I hear a lot of spiritual people uh, say. They throw it out and oh, she was a beautiful soul. He's a beautiful soul. Like, how the hell do you know that? Do you see souls? Are you a soul seer? <laughs> are you just saying that you you like them are they a beautiful personality like how do you see their soul when you come to know your own soul you'll see that you can't even see your own soul one way i like to think of the word soul s-o-u-l is s-o-l-e there's many ways you could think s-o-l like the sun you could think soul like the soul of your foot or soul of your shoe i think soul as in a soul proprietor meaning solo, soul, solo. It's the one God, but your vantage point from it. And that is within you, behind your mind and emotions and body. When you learn to relax, you, which is like yoga, you go into Shavasana, this thing at the end. Oh boy, I had such a profound experience. I just recalled it right now. I was laying in Shavasana. If you don't know about this posture, this is uh, you know yoga postures. You stretch your body, you're breathing. It's really sensational for your whole muscles, all your nervous system, and you're pushing oxygen. It's different. I did. I played a lot of soccer, wrestled for years in university. I wrestled, and I did all kinds of hiking and uh, exercise. I was a state champion cross country runner. So I was a, a good runner and I did all kinds of things here and there, baseball. Um, and then I got into yoga, right? Um, there's something different about the breathing synchronized with the stretching. Like I would run long distance or bicycle long distance, synchronizing your breathing with the repetitive movement. It, it's almost like, if you just focused on that, you would go, you would carry your body, body further than if you tried to focus on your arms swinging and your legs swinging. And um, even in martial, martial arts, I, as I get into jujitsu, but even in wrestling, there wasn't too much focus on the breathing, but as I look at it and as I practice, it was there. The exhale propels you, the inhale rejuvenates you and, and you do it almost in times of safety. Right? So... We do this stretching and breathing routine that exacerbates the physical system. Let's get you guys a definition for that right there. Exacerbate definition. T 
Okay, that's not the right word. I used the wrong word. <laughs> let's just say exhaust. <laughs> wow, that was the wrong word. Okay, let's go back to exhaust. Extremely weary, wear out, uh, to deplete. You deplete the body of its restlessness, deep, deep restlessness, because when you go into some of these stretches, regardless of how flexible you are, you're going to go deeper. There's surface muscles, and there's it's not really like a medium layer, but the, the muscles are layered on top of each other in your body. And there's some deeper ones that you really only get to in – in a, in a really sincere way, meaning like you're trying to hit, get them and you can do it on both sides. When the surface muscles relax, you got to relax the surface muscles to get deeper in the pelvis and the shoulder, the spine. And there's a lot of sensation there. There's a lot of mental imagery that you can stir up by stimulating your nervous system because that's where the mental imagery, like how do you process mental images is your nervous system. Like that's how you see your mind. Your nervous system is the is the elect it's the it's the wiring of the software program this computer has wiring and it's running software and i could see images on the computer i could run a, a whole program i could do math i could write it's even a touch screen so i could write and draw that's like the mind almost and the the nervous system would be like the circuitry and the power the electricity is the energy we take from eating And how corroded is your machine? And how much do you clean it? How much do you upgrade its software? And even its hardware, really. Because once the machine is all used up, the software lives on. The software transcends. That would be like your mind. Once the, mo once the software goes out, well, the only thing that would still exist would be the whatever residue still exists of how you influenced future generations of computers and future generations of software. The imprint lives on, even if the name doesn't. Maybe the name does. There are some names that go back a long time. And then where is you in that? There's the body, there's the mind, but where, where am I? Oh, man. It's a question that I don't even know that I really asked myself that much, but when I realized I wasn't my mind and I wasn't my body, but I still exist, I exist even when I see my own mind and body as separate from me. And I realized that that was solving a, an unresolved ex, um, almost nervousness. It's like that existential, it's that midlife crisis people come to when they realize they're going to die, they've lived out half their life, and they want to change it up now. But now it's like starting over, but they're half their life. Like, so it's this crisis of mortality that you go through daily if you practice yoga like I do. And you lay in Shavasana, and like this AM, I'm looking at my face. My eyes are closed. I do all the stretching. I'm exhausted. I lay down. Now I'm practicing relaxing. I, you would think that you just stretched it out. So relaxation is just like, you just fall limp, but it's amazing how much muscles are still holding. They're holding from the effort of doing your yoga. But then if, if you can have patience, which I didn't have patience in the beginning, I was just tired for the first year. It probably took me a good nine or 10 or 12 months or whatever of practicing yoga pretty consistently and intensely so that I was, well exhausted when I'm done. It took me a year of doing that to really start to appreciate Shavasana, that the ending is, is different, but it's like, it's everything. If you took an ingredient out of the cake, what would happen to the cake? Depends on the ingredient. Take the one that makes it rise. <laughs> like, as you relax, the body relaxes, you start to see that, okay, there's some muscles that need to let go because of, I was using my muscles to lift and stretch and yank and whatever. Yank's not a good word to use for really yoga, but you know what I mean. As that relaxes, you'll see that some of it you're not able to relax and you try. And the effort of trying makes other things grip. Okay, another thing that might happen, you'll let it go, but then you'll notice you're thinking things. 
and you'll notice that your body re grips to some of the thoughts that come up. This is where a lot of people quit, actually, in Shavasana. They can't last because the thoughts, there's too many. And they, they're overwhelmed. So you didn't breathe enough in your yoga practice, I don't think, if that happens. And just wait. Just wait. You don't, the day won't last. It will pass. And it will slow down. And as it slows down, you'll notice the rate of images that come to mind slows down. Still, you'll get sidetracked on movies, little movies of your mind, movie daydreams, and you'll get swept up. You'll even enjoy it. But then you'll realize, man, I was, uh, I, I used up all of my Shavasana time daydreaming, and I don't feel as relaxed as I want to be because your body was reacting to your daydream. Just like in, at night, your body reacts to your night dream but you don't have control over it. In fact, you're less conscious than when you're daydreaming, so you have even less control. So if you're going through a not pleasant dream, you might wake up and your body doesn't feel good. All right, so Shavasana. You're laying, you did your stretches, you lay down, you're observing your mind, it's popping up, it's going, it's popping up, it's going, it's flowing, it's staying, it's doing stuff that you're not having anything to do with. <laughs> it's, you're just, now, this is where, as soon as you notice that, oh, you're looking at your mind, oh, that's my mind. Your eyes are closed. Maybe if you're like me, it's before sunrise, so it's dark out. So anything I see is my mind. Any colors, it's my mind. Any pictures, it's my mind. Any sounds, it's my mind. I turn off the space heater. Any sounds, it's my mind. I mean, maybe there's some outside, whatever, whatever. But, you know. So Shavasana, it's almost like that sense deprivation tank. So I hear, I haven't done it, but I do it every day. That's what yoga is. These things, these things that are, you know, how quiet can you make your mind? How deep into trance can you go, but still alert? Do I think that if somebody stormed into my room, that I would be ready to snap up, to, to jump up? I heard a yogi tell a story of doing yoga in his tent in Africa, and he heard a lion. And he thought, good thing I'm doing yoga. Good, what a time to practice fearlessness in my warrior pose. That was the best warrior pose I ever did. Because what are you going to do? Stop? Stop breathing? I don't know. I guess you do that. Live in panic. Maybe, I don't know if he did, the, maybe one of us, we try that, we think we're cool, and then the, the lion knows we're there and attacks us, you know? It's like the monk, Thich Nhat Hanh, or whatever his name was, whatever that guy's name was, that lit himself on fire, self-immolation, and he didn't move, and he sat there, and he burned for 15 minutes protesting the war in, in Cambodia or something until his corpse fell over, and it all burned to ashes. They poured gasoline on him. That's how he lit himself, and... His heart supposedly didn't burn. Everything burned. But supposedly his heart didn't burn. He didn't move. He sat there. Wow. That brought, a, that brought global attention to communism invading Cambodia. And a bunch of people tried self-immolation after that and wounded themselves and died of their wounds and they screamed and yelled. And they didn't have the, what it took to do that. You know? So there's a mimicry. Like... As you, I, don't, I forgot how I got on that, but as you relax in Shavasana, drop the, the, you'll see the mind happening. It'll be more clear to you. Just relax through it. Just keep going through it. You will settle down, and you'll realize a state of relaxation more deep than you've ever really consciously felt on the other side of that drama. And then, get ready. Another drama is coming. It comes in waves. On the other side of that next mental storm, deeper relaxation. At some point, you'll get to your limit. This is where you build up, like if you see people that meditate a long time, they can't start on six hours. You build up your tolerance to go through these deeper, more subtle energy fluctuations of your mind, the storms, stormy mind. Disturbed mind is what they call it. Chitta vikshepa, disturbed mental thoughts. So 
which we're on a suppressive planet. Like we control each other by like tell, being very negative and threatening and toxic. It's a prison planet. So the language here, whatever, whatever, man. As you relax and you see your mind, here's what I do. As soon as I notice that I start, this, this is the, this is the phrasing of it is like you get involved with it. As you start to get involved with your mind and you notice that, oh, my body's going along for a ride as I observe the movie. That's where you ask yourself, who's looking at this thought? Who is looking at this thought? Who's looking, if you're, if you're not a thinking person, a visual person, maybe you're more feeling person and the feeling comes up in your chest or belly or in your arm and you're like, internally, who's looking at this feeling? Who is looking at this feeling in my body? Who's looking at my body? My mind is looking at my body. Okay, who's looking at my mind? Then that's when you realize that your body is in your mind. And looking at your body internally is looking at your mind at your body. Your mind is looking at your body. You're looking at your mind. And a beautiful soul lies behind the mind. The viewer, that's why there's no looking at it. As soon as there's something to see, that's your mind. It's an image. You are the viewer of your mind which is not a thing, but how else do we talk about it? So that's where you get the philosophy of dualism versus non-dualism. Dualism is you are a self, you have a self, you are a self, you don't have a self. You are a self who, and you have a mind and body. You are the self, the true Atman, the soul. You have a soul. Non-dualism is there is no self, that's an illusion. There's no thing. You are the experience, you're not the experiences you have. They just come and go. And when they're done, uh, you know, what residue is in your mind may carry on as karma or whatever. But when you completely dissolve your karmas and burn all the seeds of your karma, then your essence, which is non essence, returns to the source, which is not source. It's not a thing. Source is not a thing. It's, it's very, it's confusing, but I get it. It's, you, you got to do like word poetry to somehow talk about a thing and then negate its existence. That's non-dualism. Dualism is we're not going to try to negate that thing, but we're going to admit that it's not a thing. It's just, it's, a, it's, it's absurd, really. And in the West, we say you have a soul. The, the problem is the West philosophies maybe don't acknowledge reincarnation that much. And maybe that's true. Maybe it's not. It doesn't matter. I know that this morning I'm laying in Shavasana. I'm relaxing. Deeper and deeper and deeper, sinking into the floor. Long Shavasana. It's like a 60-minute Shavasana or something. And I'm aware. I'm alert. I actually made the decision to not keep pushing in my yoga stretches because I was just starting to get a little tired. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to take a longer Shavasana. And I start scanning my face, the, bo the bone, the skull structure. And I see my face as a skull, but from behind, like I see the skull and I see my body as a skeleton. And I literally see my body as the corpse decaying after I'm dead. Like imagine your own mind, you're in your body, but it's dying and it's with, and it's just, but you're still the youthful, you know, you, it's still you because you at 60 is still you now. Because you now is you from when you were 16. It's still you, you're just more aware. Which is really your mind, because how much of that... You know what, I, I, let me take that back. Understanding is in the mind. Awareness... Is almost, it's like when the mind gets out of the way. When the mind comes in the way... That's different from what's really happening. What's really happening, the mind is perceiving the world and you're perceiving your mind. So we are aiming for a clear seeing where the mind is clear and we go right through it and just perceive the world. So awareness is actually no mind there, but direct perception versus I understand something. So logically I can 
put it all together so I can stand under my logic and the bridge won't fall on me. Okay, so beautiful soul. It is beautiful. It's glorious. When you look at your mind and you see it and you notice who's looking at this, who's looking at this mind, your mind will shut up. As it tries to answer, it looks for what doesn't exist and can't be described. It keeps looking for what's looking at it. You're, lo you're relaxed. You're laying down. The images come to mind. They're slowing down as you relax more and more. Now you have moments of pause, actually, in between thoughts so that you actually notice the bubbling up of a thought from somewhere, who knows where. And you'll notice your attention gets grabbed by the thought and you'll let it go. Another thought will come up. It'll grab your attention, let it go. Some will grab your attention, hold it, take you for a whirlwind. Maybe eventually you let it go. Some, you just, it doesn't even grab your attention. You're so practiced that as thoughts come up, they, they still come. You can't even stop it, but you can relax the body before the thought energy pulls it like a puppet. You're puppeted through life by your mind. Your mind is puppeting you through life. And where did you design your mind? Oh, it was handed to you at 18, pre-designed for you. When did you wake up to the fact that your mind, you didn't make it for what you want in life? You got to remake it. And now we get to the core theme of the retreat. And what this podcast is, is shape-shifting. How do you shape shift, shift, shift shape to do that thing everybody's trying to do? Attract all their goals and dreams with zero effort. <laughs> right? It doesn't have to be effort in that sense, an internal resistance. My voice just went really high. The external, yeah, there's elbow grease involved, whatever that is. But internally, how much trust and faith do you have in your form? in your form, like Donald Trump going bankrupt, starting over. But internally, did he go bankrupt? It's just the external dollars ran out. I know what it's like to run ads and the ads run out, but you know, if you just had 10 more K involved and they kept running, it would have hooked somewhere. Once it hooks, you just gotta get that hook somewhere. You know how it works. That's just that on that level. He's like a hundred thousand times a higher level financially or whatever the fuck it is. I don't know the numbers. So the internal, bounces back because it never, it never changed. It was the internal of growth. How do I connect people? How do I communicate? How do I sell? How do I create? And versus the person that wins the lottery doesn't have the internal for money. So it just drains away. Like, I don't know, pouring a swimming pool on a rock. It just pours off of it. You don't have a container for that. It's not designed to hold that amount of energy. So we must reshape yeah, our bodies, our nervous systems, and our minds. And it's possible, but we want to start from relaxation. Otherwise, we carry the residue of prior creation, of prior imprints. Now, it's a lofty goal. It's an idealistic, but that's what we're going for. Each day, I die again. Consciously, I relax to the point of I feel as if I might let go of this whole life. And then I come back and I get up and, whoa, what a shift in perspective. Now you don't have time for toxic negativity because you just saw your death and you just got a second chance. Now, that doesn't mean you don't get triggered. People around you don't get triggered. You don't care about people. So there's a difference, right? Leaders, followers, what are you going to do for the whole tribe, for yourself? If you incapacitate yourself, a lot of people may rely on you. So now we need discernment. This is different levels of wisdom that come on top of that. The spiritual wisdom that you're a self will, give you, will take you very far in life and will give you a lot of fortitude and confidence in that you know what's best for you because you actually are in touch with you, capital Y, you, behind the mind. So it's a spiritual strength, but the mind is still going to push and pull and yank you. And, you know, the life triggers us because we didn't, 
just because we acknowledge the self and we touch it sometimes or we connect with it, we identify from it. As soon as we engage with life again, we're in the realm of the mind. And our mind was designed by our parents and people that coerced us to get us to behave the way they wanted. And so we grow up like the elephant chained that was a baby chained to the pole. As an adult, it never breaks the chain. So we need to shape shift and realize more of our potential. It starts from relaxing and then creating. And creation is a different subject. That's a lot of what I do in the silent flute. Relaxation, I tell you, everybody, I'm very excited. Everybody that's coming live to this retreat, there are four people coming live. There's a bunch of people signed up online. More people are going to be signing up online. If you're interested, send me a message, uh, Yoga Bliss Chris, or you know how to contact me. If you catch the recording, then you catch the next retreat too. I mean, there's recordings for the retreat. You can hit me up for that too, if you like. But I got a lot of stuff. I got a lot to offer, right? The core theme of all of these people are going to leave, not necessarily leave more relaxed, because that's to say that they're going to go to the airport and be more relaxed. They will likely leave more relaxed or, you know, when they, than when they arrive. But at some point, probably a few points throughout the retreat, they're going to access calm stillness, alert calm stillness, and get closer and closer to themselves and more and more discerning of what is not themselves in their mind, which it brings a lot of emotions, we, good and bad. There's a bliss. That's what yoga bliss is. Like, it's not just my name. It's a term in yoga, yoga bliss, yogananda. Yogananda is yoga bliss. So it brings a kind of spiritual bliss, even if it brings a kind of mental anguish when we realize we're not the things we identified so tightly with. We don't, these are just words until you unidentify with them. And so you will leave with a imprint, a new imprint, a new reference or new standard of what calm alertness is. And this will make you more a master of your destiny. And, and of course the silent flute, we do a lot of creation there. That's where, what happens in silent flute. So go to ninepoint.com for that. Send me a private message for the retreat. And I'll end the recording here. Stick around, ask, answer any questions. See you next time, everybody, from the viewer behind my mind to the viewer behind your mind. Namaste.